conclusion of this, this kind of section of, of the sermon series. And so in some ways I'm wrapping up what we've been talking about a lot uh, in this. And what we've seen so far in the book of Acts is we've seen that, that Jesus rose from the dead uh, victoriously, gloriously, defeating sin and death. Over 40 days he appeared to his apostles and he taught them and he said, he said, look at scripture, it's all about me. Everything that you've read, everything that you've learned, everything that you've studied was pointing to me. And he showed them how he fulfilled that completely. And then, all of a sudden, in this crazy plot twist, he says, hey, I'm going to ascend into heaven and it's better for you because it's better that I go and I send the help of the Holy Spirit is going to come and he's going he's to dwell in and amongst you and he's going to empower you to do even greater ministry than what I have done. And that's a crazy statement in and of itself, right? But, but he does it. He ascends into heaven. They spend the time for 10 days waiting well for him to appear uh, or for him to, to honor his gift of the Holy Spirit. So he sends the gift of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost happens. Things explode. 3,000 people get saved in a single day. Uh, the church is going crazy. They're living generously in community with one another. Uh, they heal a lame man who was lame from the time he was born in this incredible miracle. Many, many more people uh, come to know Jesus as their Savior. Uh, but also they begin to experience opposition from the, uh, from the religious ruling leaders. And they come and they say, uh, they say, hey, whose power, by what power did you do this? And they say, hey, we did this by the name of Jesus and by no other. There's no other name by which we must be saved in the name of Jesus. And they proclaim it boldly and there's nothing uh, that they can do. And so they just send them off and, and warn them not to use that name anymore. But of course they're not going to obey that. They're going to obey God over men. And then they pray and they just thank God and say, God, thank you so much for what you've done. Who are we to be experiencing this and to be used by you in this powerful way? Thank you for this blessing. And we pray that you just pour more of it out on us. And then the earth shakes and the Holy Spirit fills them once again. And so that brings us up to where we're at today. And it's been an exciting ride that they have been on as the early church. Well, one of the things that I want you to see is that the grand redemptive plan of God that we see revealed in this Bible, uh, that the first couple of pages of the Bible is, is God's perfect creation. He creates everything, and everything is good, and it doesn't take long for man to sin and rebel, and so we have the fall, we have sin entering, but right from the beginning, God says, hey, I'm beginning to enact a plan of redemption where I'm going to redeem you, I'm going to, to cover your sins, I'm going to offer you forgiveness, and so for thousands of years, they're waiting for this to happen, and then finally Jesus comes, and he's the fulfillment of all that, and then he dies, which is crazy, but then he raises from the dead, and he empowers the church to do his work. And that's what we've been reading about here, and that's where we live today. And so we're in the section of Scripture, we're in the story that we are a part of. We are a part of the story as God's church. And the final section, the final chapter is going to be Jesus' return uh, to righteously judge the earth and to restore creation uh, to the perfection that we had back in the garden. So uh, we're in this in-between time, and so it's so powerful to look at what's happening in the book of Acts because it's, it's where we are today that we're continuing in this story. There's a lot that we have to learn from the church in Acts. And so as we look at this, this section, I want to invite you to pray with me and just ask the Holy Spirit to, to fill our hearts and to, uh, to reveal himself and to open up the scripture as only he can do. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning, this chance to come and to worship you, uh, just to be excited about what you're doing in the church, what you did in the church, uh, what you're doing and what you will do, God, that you're bringing it to completion. It's the already but not yet. It's the it's come, the kingdom is here, and yet the kingdom is coming in its greatest fulfillment into the future. And God, I just pray that you would just expand your kingdom territory in our hearts today. Holy Spirit, give us knowledge and wisdom to, to hear your words and to respond in our hearts well to it. And pray this in the name of Jesus. And so the way that I want to attack uh, this scripture today is really, I want to read through it, and then I want to pull out three really powerful points that we see in here. Three really powerful conclusions that we can draw about what's going on in this text and really in this whole beginning section of the book of Acts. And so we're going to read through it and then we're going to, we're going to tackle it in kind of three different chunks. Uh, but beginning in chapter 4, verse 32, uh, you can read with me, it'll be up on the screen or you can have Bible. The Bible's here by either door. Please take a Bible if you don't have one. Okay? Uh, so it says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. And there was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and bought the proceeds of what was sold and 
and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as they had need. And thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles uh, Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field and belonged, that belonged to him, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And so if we just pause here for a moment, what we're seeing is that uh, the, the apostles are boldly proclaiming the name of Jesus. The Holy Spirit has filled the church. And the natural result and the overflow of that is just this incredible generosity, this, this bottom-up welling up of, of people just loving each other, of giving generously, of meeting needs, of, of being excited and joyous about, about serving and loving one another. We get this specific example of this guy named Barnabas, and this is a setup because he's going to become a major player later on in the book of Acts, that he's going to become a key figure uh, who's involved in the spread of the gospel. And we see that early on they're, they're showing us here that this guy Barnabas was faithful, that, that he did something that was very exemplary and praiseworthy, and that he, he sold a field and he brought the money and he laid it. The apostles feet. he said, do what you will uh, for the kingdom of God. So this is a very exciting time in the church. Things are going on really great. Let's take a look at chapter 5, uh, verse 1. Begins with, but. And whenever you see the word but, you know, in, in human language, and especially in the, uh, in the Bible, you know I was going to preach about buts today, right? Uh, but when you hear the word but, it, it all depends on what we came before, right? Because if it was a good thing that was going along and all of a sudden we get but, we know that things are about to take a turn for the worse, right? If it, it was something bad, so if it's we are dead in our sins, we are separated from God, we are unworthy, but Jesus came as a, as a living sacrifice, as a spotless lamb, that's a, good, that's a good but. We're grateful for the but. We're so glad it's a powerful word in that situation. But, uh, but there's also God created everything. And it was good, but the serpent was crafty and he came and see them, right? So, so this, this marks a transition and it ties these two things together. And so realize when the Bible has written these chapters and these verses and all this, that, wasn't, that was added down the road to give us uh, mile markers and to be able to speak and to communicate with one another about what's going on here. But, but this is really the continuing flow out of what we just read. So Barnabas is shown as a really great example. It says, but a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property with the wife's knowledge, kept back for himself some of the proceeds, and brought only a part of it, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard of him. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. So we just pause here for a minute. This, uh, this story just took a dramatic turn, right? Like, everything's going along. There's some persecution, but there's healing happening. They're proclaiming the name of Jesus. They're, they're giving freely. It's joy. It's excitement. Suddenly this guy comes walking in, and he gets struck dead by the Holy Spirit, right? And, and, and you gotta, you got to kind of look at these guys, the, the young men, the youth group, right? The, the, the young guys are there, and this happens, and it always falls on those guys to do the grunt work, right? So, so somebody drops dead, and they're like, hey, hey young guys, uh, go ahead, go do your thing, right? you gotta, gotta go take care of that. So uh, be grateful that I'm not going to ask you guys to bury any dead people today. So you can be thankful for that. As far as I know, I, I don't have any plans. Um, let's continue on chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 7. After an interval... About three hours, his wife came, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your, buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And when the young men came in, they found her dead. And they carried her out and buried her beside her husband, and great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. So this is a heavy passage. This is serious, right? I mean, this is, this is deadly serious. Uh, uh, but you've got to take a moment just to look at it with a little levity. First of all, I think it's interesting that it took the young guys three hours to bury this guy. <laughs> so they're like, I've never buried anybody before. They go out. They're like trying to find, like, where do we do it? You know what I mean? So they they get it, they get done, they're like, I never want to have to do that ever again. And they come walking in, and they're like, another body. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you got to feel bad for these young guys who spent three hours burying somebody, now they got to go do it again, okay? This was not a good day for those guys, but all joking aside, though, this is, uh, this is, this is a serious passage, and, 
And it's a jarring passage. This happens throughout Scripture. When you read it, it's jarring. And it's intended to be that way. The first thing that we see and we recognize when we come to this passage and that we've got to deal with right up front is that this is not about us. It's about God. Okay? This is not the beginning of a new social club. This is not the beginning of a new political movement. This is the beginning of the New Testament, uh, New Covenant Church of the Almighty, Holy Creator of the universe. And God brings this reminder and he says, hey, this is serious, that your worship of me needs to be pure and undefiled. That you guys don't get to write the rules, that you don't get to just kind of do whatever you want, have a party and celebrate, that, that this is serious, this is very serious stuff because we need to have an awe and a reverence and a fear and a respect for God. And we've talked about this throughout Acts, that they talk about this in the Bible, this idea of having a fear of God. And, and even I'm guilty of this in our society, that we want to we kind of mellow that word out a little bit, right? We're like, well, it says fear, but it really means all reverence, respect, uh, you know, just a holy kind of understanding of who God is, and that's certainly wrapped up in it. Um, and it's not like a horror movie kind of fear, but there is genuine fear that happens when you see somebody get struck dead in front of you, that, that the fear that they're talking about is certainly a fear of God, that, that God is, is, is more vast, more powerful, more holy than we can ever recognize. And the reality is that if he appeared here right now in this moment, that we would all get down on our faces before him. And that we would recognize how unworthy we were to be in his presence. And I don't say that to beat you guys down. I just share it because it's reality. And there's so much of an imbalance of saying, hey, God is just love and peace and grace and mercy, and, and he just wants to give you a hug and hold hands with you and walk through the park, and, uh, and he knows you're a sinner, so he's just going to over over that. Hey, God is all of those things, but he's also holy and pure and worthy of our worship. And I can try and encourage you to come on, hey, come on, guys, let's just worship God. It's the best thing for you. It's going to give you the best life. But the reality is that any moment, God can stand before us and say, hey, I am worthy of your worship, and I command it. We have no choice but to respond. Uh, the fact that we have so much freedom is just an ex exhibition of his grace. So I know this is heavy, but... But, but we've got to battle against this idea that there's two gods, right? There's an Old Testament God and a New Testament God. People will approach it this way and they'll say, well, that, in the Old Testament, God was angry and he was, he was wrathful and he was always kind of striking people dead and pouring out his vengeance. But in the New Testament, he, he, he kind of had a mood change, right? He, he got happy and he, he became about love and he started, you know, giving out kittens and hugging people and putting drinks at Starbucks. Like, that's the, that's the God that we serve, right? That's, that's who, who we want to come and, and sing about. But... The reality is it's the same God. God is the same yesterday, today, forever. He never changes. His character, his nature, who he is, is unchanging. And we really see this when we look at Scripture. God had me in uh, First Chronicles this week, and, and it's all throughout Scripture. So you can throw a dart and you can pick out examples of this. But in First Chronicles, I saw this so clearly. Uh, there's this, this occasion where David is made king. And so David wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. He says, hey, it's been out in a different place, but I want to bring it in. And so he arranges this big party, he sets up musicians, he gets the people excited about it, everybody's having this big parade, processional, bringing uh, the ark in, and they load it up on this cart with an animal pulling it, and all of a sudden the animal stumbles, and so this guy named Uzzah, okay, he's already got a bad life, his name's Uzzah, right? So, so he started all behind the eight ball, right? But so the, the, the animal stumbles, the cart starts to wait, and he doesn't want the ark to fall, so he puts his hand on it to steady it. And he dies. He just drops dead like that. And David is like, whoa, God, we were, we were trying to celebrate you. We were trying to bring this in. Like, he's like, I, I can't even bring the ark into the city now. I need to. So he gives it uh, to this guy. And he says, hey, keep, keep the ark here on your land for now. We can't bring it into the city. And that guy gets his socks blessed off, by the way. So, so it, it worked out really good for him. But as we continue on reading in the book of uh, First Chronicles, what we see is that they had been disobedient. God had been very specific in his command about how the ark was to be moved and to be handled. And the priests were to take these poles and they were supposed to put it through and it was supposed to be carried by the priest. And so in their zeal for, for praising God, they had overlooked the truth and the commands of God. And so they come back and they get it right. They say, God, we're not going to do it our way. We're going to do it your way. And they are able then to joyously bring the ark in. But it just shows that God is very concerned with right worship. And that we can't just think that because we have the right heart, that we, that we want to please God, that, that our intentions are important, but it's also important to do it in the right way. God wants us to know that, and he wants us to see that, and that's why we've got to be diligent about digging into his word, because he's revealed himself. Uh, so we don't have the excuse to say, man, I didn't know. He 
It's here for us to know. So we've got to know it. There's another example later in 1 Chronicles, in 1 Chronicles 21 where David decides to take a census. He wants to see how many people he's really ruling over. And, and, and the chief of his army says, David, this is not a good thing. You don't want to do that. This, it's God's people. Just be happy that he blessed you with however many he blessed you with. And David's like, no, I want you to go out and take a census. And so he sends him out. And I love this, that he, he skips two tribes. He's like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be a part of this. So he leaves two of the tribes out of the count. But it's still like, well, you know, a million, over a million people. It's, it's all these people. And God comes in. He's very unhappy with this, that David sinned against him. And so he kind of gets off some moral choice. He's like, he's like, hey, do you want to suffer from famine for three years? Do you want the enemy to come and attack uh, for three months? Or do you want me to, to strike you with sickness for three days? Which one do you want? And David realizes that he was wrong and sinned. He repents, and he's like, He's like, I'll take option three because I'll just put myself in your hands. I, if anybody's going to come against me, I want it to be you because you may choose to relent and be merciful. But 70,000 people died because of that. Uh, this pestilence came upon them. So, so the Old Testament is full of these examples that God desires our hearts and our obedience. And even though we're, we're aligned with him and we're of the people of Israel or we're the, of the church, that we still need to worship him in spirit and in truth. We need to worship him in the right way. That God is, is zealous for this and and one of the craziest things is when we turn the page into the New Testament, what we see is the most horrific pouring out of God's wrath that we see anywhere in Scripture because God's perfect spot the Son comes and lives and, and offers himself as a sacrifice and God's wrath is poured out upon him. And so the violence of that act, the horrible nature of what happened to Jesus on the cross, far exceeds anything that we read in the Old Testament. And so this idea that when we turn the page that suddenly God uh, has become this God of of uh, just flowers and sunshine, it's just not accurate. The God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament. He's the same yesterday, uh, today, and forever, and he desires us to worship him well. Heavy but true, right? And so if we think at Riverside, as a church, that we're just going to be, man, we're the church of good intentions, and we're going we're gonna to celebrate, we're just going to kind of carve our own path and do our own thing, that's not going to work out. That's not going to last. That God is not going to bless that. And God may choose to judge and punish that. It's his prerogative, and, and, and Paul tells us in the book of Romans, he says, hey, don't mistake God's forbearance of judgment. Don't, don't make the mistake that just because he's put off judging you that he doesn't care about it. He's allowing you room for repentance. He's allowing you room to turn around, and you need to grab a hold of that today. Uh, don't miss this opportunity to worship him well. And so the first thing we see here, it's not about us, it's about God, and God is going to fence in and protect the unity his church, that God is very zealous for his church to be unified and to worship him well, and that he's going to play an active role in protecting the unity of his church. The danger for us is when, because uh, the really toxic mixture here is when pure and holy worship mixes with uh, hypocritical, unholy, wrong intention worship. When those things come together, it's like oil and water, they don't mix, and and at least it's something more explosive than oil and water, right? We put oil and water, they don't explode. I don't know. We have a chemist in here. Like, what are two things that, you know, I don't know. Anyways, you guys get the point, right? Uh, it's explosive when that happens. The danger for a church is if we just abandon pure and holy worship, that we can get into much, we can be uh, hypocritical, we can be false, we can do whatever we want, and it's not going to lead to friction. It's not going to lead to an explosion because holy worship and pure worship of God is not in the building anymore. And so, so there's nothing for it to react against, okay? And so there's an element in which this judgment, this friction, uh, this, this testing and this pushing is a good thing because it shows that, that, that holy worship of God cannot exist with unholy worship of God. So I will start out heavy. Don't worry. We're, we're coming down a little bit from there, right? So, so we're bringing the big guns. But that's the thing we've got to deal with right off the bat. It's about God. It's always about God. It's always about having an awe and a reverence and a respect and a fear for God in a holy way because uh, he's not sitting up there being like, man, I hope they obey me. Man, because I really want to redeem the world, but I need some people to jump on board. I need some recruits. I need some people to volunteer. God doesn't need us to redeem the world, but he invites us to come in. And we need to grab that invitation with both hands and, and, and jump in. Second thing we see here is that when we move into enemy territory, when we invite the Holy Spirit to fill us, when we go forward in obedience and power that the enemy is going to attack. He doesn't want to lose ground. And so we've seen this throughout the book of Acts. The first thing that he did was he ridiculed. He tried to undermine and ridicule uh, the church. And so when they came out speaking in many different tongues and languages, the people around there were like, oh, those guys are just drunk. They were just out watching the World Cup last night and having too many beers and, and too much celebration. And, and now they're just speaking in different languages. I know it doesn't make any sense, but 
uh, just laugh it off, right? That, that it begins with ridicule, right? Like, oh, don't even take them seriously. They believe in creation. Come on, everybody knows it's evolution now. Don't even, don't even take them seriously. Just whatever, right? That's where he begins. That didn't work. 3,000 people got saved from Peter's sermon. So, so he began to up it a little bit. So he began to bring oppression from the religious authorities. And so the religious authorities, even though somebody had just been healed in a miraculous way that could come from no one but God, and they should have came and said, oh my goodness, God is moving here. They're like, this is exciting. But rather they came in and they said, hey, they're, they're not lining up with our theology. Let's pull them in and question them on how they did this and what's going on. And so they, they, they put them in jail overnight. They questioned them. But all the apostles would say, hey, it's up to you to decide whether we should listen to you or listen to God. But, but we're going to choose to listen to God. We're going to be obedient. We can't help but be obedient. And there was nothing they could do. And so the second way he attacked us was through oppression of the religious leadership. Now we see the third and the most insidious and the most dangerous way that he attacks us from within the church. He attacks the unity of the church uh, by bringing in hypocrisy that he, he plays on the sin nature that's born in each one of us, that we're each born with sin in our hearts, that we're, that we're marked with sin from birth. I know that the, the lie of this culture is that we're all good people. Hey, we're good people. We make a few mistakes here and there, but generally, we're born good. We, we have good intentions and desires. There's a few bad apples, uh, but the reality is that we're born marked with sin. And when we come to Jesus and we're reborn, uh, we're, we're filled with the Holy Spirit and we become a new creation, the reality is that our identity has changed, that we are a new creation. We're no longer uh, we're no longer controlled by our sin, but the reality is that there's a, a piece of that sin nature that still hasn't died off, and if we're not careful to fight against it, it can creep up in our lives. And so we've got to be careful, we've got to be on guard against that, and Satan knows where our weakness is, and he comes after it. How many of you guys have read the screw tape letters by C.S. Lewis? Anybody? Anybody out there? It's a fascinating book in which a, a senior demon, it's a fictional work, a senior demon is writing to a junior demon, and he's kind of giving him strategy tips on how to tempt and distract and, and lead this new believer off the path of following Jesus and to minimize his effectiveness once he's come into the kingdom. And so it's a fascinating read to kind of, because as you're reading through it, you're like, man, I have those thoughts sometimes. I, I've been led down that path. And so you become very aware of the ways and the strategies that the devil used to, to trick us and convict us, and uh, not convict us, but, but distract us from what God has wanted us to do. And so that's what we're doing when we look at this here. We look at what's, what's the strategy that the enemy uses in this instance. It's really fascinating because in culture you always see, right, the, the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other shoulder, right? That's the cliche thing. You see it in the cartoons and, and a lot of times they'll flick the angel off their shoulder and be like, yeah, yeah, I'm going with this guy, right? And it's like, it's like this, this choice between good and evil that's laid out for us. And like, you choose good or choose evil. But what the devil does so many times when we see in Scripture, when we see it in our own lives, the devil comes along and says, hey, you don't have to choose. Choose. Nobody's asking you to choose. You can, you can receive all that glory and adulation that, that Barnabas got. You can receive the respect and the love of the community. You can be well revered in this Christian community by, by giving some of the money, but you can also protect yourself in the future by keeping a little bit back for yourself. It's the best of both worlds. That's what the devil's continual lie is, right? In the garden, he comes and he says, he says you're not going to die if you eat that fruit. In fact, you're going to become more like God. You guys can probably become buddies. You're going to be on more of an even, even playing field. And it might even improve your relationship with him because you're going to know the same things that he knows. That, you know, you don't have to choose, right? He said to the nation of Israel when they came in, uh, God gave them specific plans. I need you to cleanse the land because if you leave people here, their idol worship is going to infiltrate into your lives and it's going to, to water it down. And when they got in there, there were groups that came and said, hey, white flag. Don't kill us. Don't kick us out. Just let us live here. We'll serve you. And you don't have to abandon worshiping the God of Israel, but, but just allow us a little bit of leverage to worship our God. And you can worship our God, too. You can do both. You don't have to choose. You know, worship your God, worship our God. More worship, more better, right? Like, more, you've got more, more options, more irons in the fire. Have you experienced this in your own life where God was pushing you towards something? And, and instead of uh, choosing, as you knew you were supposed to choose, uh, this voice that comes in and says, hey, you don't have to choose. You can do both. You got, you got options. You can, you can kind of play a couple of options and kind of see which one works out. I love it. In our small group, we've been working through this book, What is the Gospel? And the thing that it hammered down to this week is that the passage uh, where Paul says, hey, if, if Jesus is not risen from the dead, if he is not resurrected, then we are to be pitied above all people. Uh, that, that if the gospel is not true, Christians should be completely sunk. We should be pitiable. Uh, we should be 
the wretched of the earth, right? That, that's what it means to put your faith and trust in Jesus. Uh, it doesn't mean that I trust that he's going he's gonna, to uh, provide for my earthly needs right here and now. More than anything else, it means that I'm trusting on his perfect and spotless record. That when I stand before God, that God is not going to look at all the sins and the evil faults and the bad intentions of Ezra, but rather he's going to look on the perfect work of Jesus Christ and he's going to apply that to me because Jesus bore my sins on the cross. That that's the truth. And if that is not true, I don't have a plan B. But as Christians, we don't have a plan B. We don't, we don't kind of like work it out like, hey, well, you know, I'm a pretty good person. I give. I'm generous. I'm kind. And so if it's a karma kind of deal, I'm probably good with that. And if it's, uh, if it's reincarnation, I'm probably in pretty good shape. You know, I'm, I'm kind of doing good on all levels, right? That's not how it is. That for, as Christians, that we're driven to put everything, all of our hope, all of our faith, all of our trust in Jesus or not. God drives us to rely on him in that kind of way. But the devil, as we see here, the devil says, hey, you can have it both. And at times when uh, I'm doing my research and, and listening to other certain stuff, sometimes this will be a, a section where pastors will really drive at this idea of giving, right? Like, hey, uh, you know, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that, you know, you're, you're stealing from God if you don't give and everything. And, and sometimes this could turn into a fear-based message about giving where you say, hey, if you don't give the full tithe, God is going to strike you dead. Right? But I don't want to preach that message to you because I don't want to exchange one bad set of intentions for another bad set of intentions. I don't want you to, to come out of fear and be like, man, I'm so afraid of God. I'm just going to give and, and hope that I, I can buy him off. If I give this much, then he won't strike me dead. He won't let me get sick. He won't let me lose my job. My car won't break down. If I, I, I'll just buy him off, right? That's, that's not the way that Christianity works. That's not what following Jesus and faith in Jesus. That's not what's proclaimed all throughout Scripture, that we don't buy God off with our giving. The real issue here was a hard issue. It's very similar to the story of, of Cain and Abel, the, the, the true, the history of Cain and Abel that we see in the Bible, that, that they both came, and they both gave an offering, right? But Abel gave up the best, his first fruits, that, an offering that was pleasing to God because it came from the right place in his spirit, whereas Cain came and just gave an offering. He just gave something. And so sometimes when you look at it, you would think like, oh, well, Cain, Cain didn't give anything that I could understand, but why was God upset? He gave something. And God says to him, he says, Cain, don't don't go on the path of the poor. Don't be angry. Don't be upset. You know what it takes to be acceptable. You know what an acceptable offering is. And so just do it. Do what I've asked you to do. Come with the right heart. But if you don't, Satan is crouching at the door. And he's waiting to pounce on you. And sadly, Cain did not listen or respond in a repentant way uh, to what God had to tell him. And so, so as you guys know, he ended up killing his brother Abel out of anger and jealousy. And it's the same thing here that, that it wasn't. Look, they gave a generous a uh, generous, outwardly-looking gift uh, to God. And so the problem wasn't that they didn't give. In fact, uh, you see in your Peter says to him, hey, you had that land. You didn't have to sell it. It was yours. And even after you sold it, you had the money. You didn't have to give it. It was yours. But when you came and you presented and acted like you were giving it all and, and deceived the church and, and lied to the Holy Spirit, that's where you got into trouble, that you came with the wrong intention, the wrong heart. So there's, there's people in the church that give regularly with a wrong heart, not out of generosity, not of the overflow of the Holy Spirit working in their life, but because they're just trying to buy off their guilt. They're just trying to buy off God's vengeance. And they're trying to say, man, if I just drop a couple bucks in the plate, hopefully that'll get me through the week. And God will do that. And I don't want you to have that heart. I want you to have the heart that the church has. And we see this in the third point. So the first point, it's not about us. It's about God. It's about revering and awe and reverence. Holy God wants to interact with us. This is His church. It's not my church. It's not your church. Uh, you know, it's God's church. The second thing is that the enemy is going to attack when we move forward. But listen, I, I end with the good news, right? When we pursue the Holy Spirit, we're filled with Him. We are joyfully generous. So this is not a sermon about elevate generosity, pursue generosity. Here are 27 steps to get to generosity. This is a sermon about pursue the Holy Spirit. Elevate Jesus. Go after him. Ask him to fill you. Pray to him. Seek him. Proclaim the gospel. And the result is that you will be joyfully generous. It's a mark of the Spirit working within you. I would much rather have a bunch of people that are just pursuing God, pursuing the Holy Spirit, and allow him to work through however he wants to, than to come up here and give you a seminar on how to be more generous and how to change your budget and how to... Uh, you know, forego things and you can do other things. Those things are all important and they're helpful and they're biblical and I have no problem with that. But the heart of the issue, the root of the issue is a desire to please God. It's a 
allowing the Holy Spirit to work in and through you. Like I said, I'm going over the fruit of the Spirit with my with my kids at night, and I told them, hey, I don't want you to walk away from this and say, man, I just got to be more patient. I got to work more patience. I got to, no, you got to pray. You got to pursue God. You got to allow, say, God, I can't do this. Send your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, fill me in a new and fresh way so that I have patience that I never had before, that I have love and joy and peace and kindness and gentleness and self-control, all these fruit of the Spirit that are flowing out of the Holy Spirit working in me. Because we can fake it, right? We're pretty good at faking it. You can outwardly fake it to everyone except yourself because you know what your real depth of your heart is. And God, God knows <laughs> what your heart is. And so there's two people who always know the truth. And you can look good to everyone outside you, but it's not doing you any good to do. It's not the end goal. Generosity is not the goal. It's not the goal, like, man, if we just were a generous church, we'd nail it, right? No, it's that we're a Holy Spirit-led, Holy Spirit-filled, a Jesus-honoring, God-revering church. That's the goal. And the awesome byproduct of that is generosity and needs being met. The other amazing and fascinating thing in here is this inverse relationship uh, of love for things and love for people, right? We see it in the beginning here. It says, uh, uh, Verse 32, now the full number of those who believed were one heart and one soul. There's incredible unity. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and the great grace was upon them all. And there was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold to laid at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each that in need. We see here that that there's this incredible inverse relationship about uh, the more that you care about stuff, the less that you care about people. And the more that you care about people, the less that you care about stuff. And, and test this in your own heart and in your own relationship and what you've seen in life uh, is just a reality that you'd like to think, man, when I come to GC, expanded my heart to where I still like, really love stuff, but I still really, but now I really love people too. It's like my heart got bigger, like the Grinch, it like expanded three sizes, right? And now I can love stuff and I can love people. So I can love all these things that I have, like and I'm, I, I love them, they're my precious, and I, you know, I, I pet my pile of gold at nighttime, right? It's like, oh, I love it, but I love people too, you know? We don't get, you can, it, it's the same lie, right? The devil said, hey, you can love both. You can love stuff, you can love people, you can love them both. Why choose, right? I feel like there's commercials on, all the TV, on TV all the time. Why choose? You can have it all. Why make this difficult choice? But the reality is that we, we choose. We love people or we love things. And as the Holy Spirit is working in our hearts, we love people more and more and more. And we care about things less and less and less. And that's why they're able to say, think about the culture at this time. They didn't have the bank. Most of us have in our pocket this magic piece of plastic that, that says somewhere out there that, that we either have a bunch of money or somebody's willing to lend us a bunch of money at a high interest rate. <laughs> but it gives us purchasing power, right? Uh, they didn't have that back then. And so if they had wealth, they invested it in things, in land, in, in homes, in livestock, in clothing, in, in riches, in, you know, in gold, whatever it was that they had, had stuff. And so they didn't have liquid cash available. And so these guys would come, and they would come into the assembly and be like, man, there's so many people that have needs, and, and I'm sitting on three vineyards. I could sell one of those vineyards, and I could bring it. And I want to do this. God's place is in my heart. Like, it's a joy. I can't wait to do this. Think about this picture of like, a, uh, you know, if you have your treasure, whatever you value, whatever stuff or thing that you value the most, and it's in this treasure chest, and suddenly you're dropped into the ocean, right? You have two choices. You can either grab a hold of that thing and let it drag you all the way down to the bottom until it drowns you, or you can let go of it, and you can go up to the surface. And that's how things are in our lives sometimes, that, that, that we grab a hold of them so tightly, uh, and we're unwilling to let go and it drowns us spiritually. That we're not in a position, we're not willing, we don't even have a desire to love and to serve and to honor other people. And I don't want that for a church, I don't want that for me, I don't want that for you. Now, now recognize, we live in a material world. And we're not material girls. <laughs> right? Madonna was, was, she was a little bit right. She, she was living in a material world and she was a material girl, right? So she, she got that one right. Uh, we live in a material world. It's a world of substance. That it's a, a world of good substance that God created, right? So, so God's creation is good. Uh, but when we idolize it, when it becomes an idol, it, it turns bad. And so every one of us this morning got up and we chose to put on some sort of clothes, right? We had to wear something. We, you know, 
it's not that kind of church. You had to wear something <laughs> to church this morning, right? And so, so every one of us is wearing some sort of material possession. That's a good thing. That's necessary. That's you know, the, the, we can't go through this world and be immaterial. You know, the one extreme is say, man, I'm just going to be a monk. I'm just going to sell off all my stuff. I'm going to go live in an abbey somewhere, and uh, I'm just going to reject materialism altogether. And if people choose that. Hey, that's between them and God, and I don't stand in judgment of them. But what I want to say to you is that. Um, rejecting materialism altogether, you just kind of like tried to just avoid it. And I think that God really wants us to live in this material world in a way that honors and pleases and glorifies him. There's the parable of talents, right, where God gives to different ones, different amounts. And he didn't want them to go and bury it in the ground and avoided it. He wanted them to take the talents that he'd given them and invest them and, and, to, and to, to, uh, to grow it so that it could be used for even greater things. And to the one who had the most, he took the one who had none and gave it to that one. And so I think it's just a biblical thing that we're called to use whatever things God has given us well for his honor and for his glory, that we're called to be generous, or that we're called to give out of a joyous and generous heart. And that's my heart for you, and that's my heart for me, and that's where I want us to land on this. Listen to this, uh, this awesome prayer that uh, continued in First Chronicles. Um, that's just where I was this week, so that's what you guys are getting, okay? Um, and it's awesome because there's so many good examples. But listen, if you want to turn there with me, First Chronicles chapter 29. Um, what had happened is uh, David had it on his heart. He's like, it's not right for me to be living in a house and for, for God to be living in you know, the ark to be in a tent. I want to build a home for the Lord. And, and God said, hey, I honor your intention here, but you're a man of war. You've got blood on your hands. You're not going to be the one to build the temple. Your son is. But David went ahead and gathered all the resources. He wanted to set his son Solomon up as well as he could. And so... He went and he got gold and he got timber and he got everything that he was going to need. And then David came before the people and said, hey, out of my own wealth, out of my own uh, store of wealth, I'm generously giving. I'm just choosing to give all this towards the temple. And I invite you to do the same. And the people of Israel responded in the same way. They just came and went over above and they gave, uh, you know, in a, in a really exaggerated, amazing, incredible, generous way to build the temple for God. And listen to David's awesome prayer at this moment. First uh, Chronicles 29, verse 10. Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. This is a reflection of what we've been talking about, right? This revering, this awesome reverence and respect for God. All that is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I, and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. It's all yours. We're just giving it back to you. You've blessed us so abundantly that we're in a position to give what's already yours back to you, God. For we are strangers before you and sojourners, as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no abiding. O oh Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided through building you a house through your holy name, comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of the heart, I have free will offered all these things. And now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. O oh Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep forever uh, such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people. That's a prayer for us, right? Keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. Grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, confirming all that he may that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. What an awesome prayer. He says, God, this is all yours. Who are we that you blessed us so richly that we're able to be generous? You put us in this position. This is awesome, God. And I say this for our church today. Who are we that God has blessed us in such a way that he's given us this building that, that came in about in a way that was, was not possible in human stand, standpoint, but, but from God's standpoint, it was no big deal. He just shifted some assets around and he said, hey, I'm going to give this to you. And so, so when groups and mission teams come and say, hey, can we stay in your building? 
man, who am I that we get to bless a mission team by allowing them to stay here in our facility? What a pleasure and a joy. Who are we that God has blessed us to live in a time where we live in the most wealthy nation that has ever existed on the face of the earth, that we live, according to the, the banners they have out here, worship is like one of the 20 best places to live in the, in the whole country, right? That's what they're claiming. Who are we to be blessed to be born and to live in this time and in this place and with so many races and so many blessings? And my heart is that hopefully we get to a point where we say, who are we that we get to give so generously to your work, to your kingdom? That's my heart. And in conclusion, I just want you to see, and this is really important to see, that, that Jesus is the perfect example all of this, that Jesus honored and revered the Lord, that he did nothing without coming before the Father, that he prayed, that he sought God, that he always respected and honored the law. He said, I didn't come to do away with the law, I came to fill the law, that I do this, everything I do in obedience to my Father. That Jesus was tempted by, by the devil, but he was attacked by the devil, but he resisted him, and he defeated him at the cross, and, and in the moment of temptation in the wilderness, he used God's word to him and planted his heart to battle against him, and he's our example not just avoiding confrontation with the enemy, but having victory in the confrontation with the enemy. And finally, Jesus is the most joyfully generous person to ever live. He cared nothing for stuff and totally for people. He's, he's the, the top of the chart on this. He sacrificed everything for us. Listen to the words in conclusion. Philippians 2, verses 1 through 11. So if therefore is any, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord with one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and in heaven on earth and under the earth, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God.